you know my friend uh, sham in the previous panel discussion he was uh, making a, a statement that you know it's not very difficult in our industry to train people because you know they already have an mep background yeah. you know you just train them for 3 4 months and then get get them onto the solar industry but uh, what i hear from you is you know there goes uh, you know a hell lot of engineering into right designing so when offshore you were saying that that's what i was thinking that not in uh, floating not, uh, in, not floating in floating anymore not in floating yes so so what kind of challenges do you face in terms of uh, you know uh, getting the right resources to design uh, you know uh, or generally in offshore renewable space right so so basically you know uh, let's say let's talk about dubai uh, like uae uh, we have an oil and gas industry right uh, you have uh, oil offshore but but the water depth is very uh, low it's not more than 50 meters so you do not need any type of floating platforms as such they are like fixed platforms and uh, people understand that the engineers understand how to design fixed type of platforms uh, but this uh, floating solar industry, it's not fixed. Uh, it's, you know, the, the uh, solar plant is on water and so it is moving. So then that's why you need a highly qualified first naval architect. I am a naval architect. Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm in this space. So you need naval architects. You need to also know how the plant is going to behave in, uh, in waves, you know. So you need to do really high end numerical uh, simulations for that. And another thing is that since this industry is so new, there are not available guidelines as well as standards. Although we have three gigawatt of plants, but they are all on inland reservoirs with very less wave action, I would say. Right. So it is very challenging, absolutely. But you know, the way industry is moving forward, more and more uh, people from the offshore oil and gas background who were dealing with floating systems are coming into uh, this uh, new field. Right. right. Thank you, Rahul. Sure. Uh, Hamze, uh, you're a special panel member for us today because you are somebody who used to be a part of the industry and now you're part of the academics. So, you know, as we understand, you know, there is a big gap between the academics and the industry. You know, the moment, you know, people come out of the academic institutions, they're not always ready for the industry and that is where experts like you come in and, you know, bridge that gap. So, as part of being a director of, uh, you know, this German uh, uh, academic institution. Uh, what's your role in terms of preparing uh, uh, the youngsters for the industry? Um, actually, you t uh, tackled exactly the point why I was appointed the director of the academy. So, based on my various background in industry or on, at the supplier side and the EPC side, that was uh, one point or one key uh, that led me to this uh, position, which is as uh, equally challenging to be on the EPC side or on the sales side of a supplier. The thing is that we really have a gap and the market and the industry is moving uh, very fast. I do double what uh, Shyam said in the previous uh, uh, panel. Yeah, we have the expertise, we have uh, sufficient people, but still we always have a, a knowledge gap. And this does not come because uh, the companies are not uh, knowing what they need. It's because the academic is not as fast as the movement in the industry. And for this reason, I think it's one of the important part in the region here to fill this gap with the partnership, with the EPCs, with the manufacturer, so that the technicians or the salespeople, as well as the contractors, would know how to handle the new job descriptions. So we see ourselves more as upskilling programs, upskilling uh, entity, where we can check the job description from company A or EPC B and find people who are 50 or 70% meeting those qualifications, but we upskill them so they don't need to have uh, training later on uh, in the company. So they would be prepared for the market. And specifically now, as we see e even in our panel, that we have various backgrounds, various interests, all in the energy or solar industry, but each of them might have a, a skill that is very specific for them. So I might have an EPC expert with more than 10 years experience, but he has no experience in installing uh, offshore or floating panels. So this is where uh, upskilling program will come. 
the same with the EV uh, chargers or with the smart buildings, with the cleaning. So we have the experience, we have the uh, talents already, we just need to level them up to the expectation of the companies that will hire them. Thank you, Hamze. Uh, another important aspect is that, you know, uh, at some point in time, even the governments will have to pitch in and, you know, make sure that that skill, upskilling uh, is always supported, right? So you're part of a collaboration between uh, Germany and Jordan, mm -hmm. where, you know, uh, two countries have come together in establishing an academy and, you know, upskilling uh, the youngsters. So going forward, how do you see this trend of governments contributing to the upskilling uh, coming up? Um, yeah, I think this is also one of the important aspects where maybe the German government or the German industry have looked forward to the situation, not only for their industry, but for the market. Uh, in the past, especially in oil and gas industry or maybe in uh, telecommunication, uh, companies from US, uh, Japan, Germany would come, give their expertise, but they ke kept it for themselves. And then there was always a gap between the receiver and the provider. Today, the governments see that if you don't do upskilling and the capacity building in the technologies and in the, you will not have actually market potential. Yeah. And that's why now the investment comes from major uh, uh, governments to invest into the upskilling and the capacity for the, uh, the, uh, the countries. And MENA is actually a big attractive market for all developed countries. Because we see in the next 10, 20, up to 2050, there will be huge plans about uh, decarbonization, uh, green hydrogen, EV infrastructure. So if we don't start today to have the right skills, then also we'll be lagging behind. We saw this in the solar industry, even if we're trying to catch up. But the German uh, government understood that there will be a gap in the future. And that's why they're investing in uh, our youth to be able to meet the expectation in the market. And I think this, would, this model will be repeated not only in Jordan, but also in other countries. And not only with Germany, I think even America, China, India will be doing the same thing to keep track with the technology de development. Right, thank you, Hamza. Yeah. I think this is a very important thing what Srimanth has said. This is the major driver, uh, the government policies and uh, funding and uh, over and above the subsidies. So we should really understand and uh, uh, definitely, I mean, UAE is on the way to, uh, you know, capturing such things, learning from the entire world. Uh, having said, but as of now, uh, it's like that the, the one who's got the money power, they can, they can have it. Yeah. But uh, we really need to consider the subsidy part because they are one of the uh, major driver because I, I have worked for uh, discoms back in Jordan. I have worked in various discoms. So, uh, you know, the cost for each uh, consumer is really important, may it be industrial or a, or a you know, um, a non-commercialized um, uh, or a commercial consumer. So we really need to get into the drivers of it. So uh, the subsidies is an important aspect. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Abhinav. So uh, as I see uh, the panel members, you know, Abhilash is from uh, smart space. Abhinav is from equipment background. Asim is from uh, manufacturing background. Rahul is from, you know, design and, you know, ocean technologies. And of course, Hamzai from academics. So in the last two years, you know, uh, we are all aware, you know, there was a COVID-induced slowdown. And, you know, uh, each of you from, you know, from your own perspective and in your own domains, you have faced uh, the COVID-induced slowdowns and you've continued to, you know, uh, mitigate the risks and you've continued to survive. And today we are all here because we've all survived. So can you quickly, you know, in, in two minutes, if you can just uh, share with us your story in terms of how did you manage during the COVID-induced slowdowns and what kind of impact it has had and uh, how do we... Uh, look forward? Um, <clears throat> very valid question at this point of time because, you know, post-COVID impact is still being faced by many of the industries. And currently the worst, I would say, has hit is, of course, the solar inverters business and, of course, same thing with the EV charging right now. You know, the reason for that is, of course, uh, lack of pre-planning because COVID was not expected and this level of disruption was not expected but still some ways to mitigate or something that we are doing 
is we are trying to predict the industry. See, you have two parts to prediction. One is fixed and variable, right? So you know that, okay, that is a fixed level to which you can predict the industry. So we plan ahead for that. So uh, if, if it is for 2024 and you need to plan now, better to start planning now, you know, rather than waiting for the last minute. Of course, UAE market is quite, uh, you know, we have spoiled the market as well. You know, there are customers who call me saying, okay, you have the product, please deliver. You know, and I've got cases like, okay, I have a big uh, uh, building to electrify. You know, please provide me the uh, products tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm really surprised that he didn't say yesterday. You know, so that's how uh, the market is. And of course, this being a trading industry or a trading um, region, you know, the cost, uh, people are ready to deliver, you know, rather than uh, looking at the uh, effectiveness. They will buy it from anywhere at any pricing and, and they will give it to the customers. But of course, uh, planning is one way that these mitigations can happen because we still have time, 2024 and 2025 is actually reachable now rather than 2023 because 2023 I feel that most of the modules are already booked. <laughs> so, uh, please don't expect any of the modules. Plus, with the Taiwan issues, I think it's going to get worse. So, you know, for 2023, uh, if you had already planned for it, well and good. If not, please only expect 2024. So, that's one takeaway that I wanted to take from here. So, planning is extremely important and specific, not just to your industry. Please look at all the other branches of impact that's going to happen and then pre-plan it as well. I mean, that's all from my side. Thank you, Oblash. Have you done? Uh, so, yes, very well said because pre-COVID and post-COVID, definitely each one of us can read at least one book on that, <laughs> whatever be it is. But what I learned as a person or as an organization that the worst experience of our life we have gone through. So the worst experience of our life gave us the best experiences, you know. So that is what we all learn. And uh, what we talk nowadays, smart city, intelligent cities, intelligent system, as a human being, we become smarter now. We become more predictive. Uh, you know, we become more like how to mitigate any, any kind of risk. So we become stronger in a way, uh, be it be a, you know, a designer or an industrialist or a bureaucrat, entrepreneur. So as a, as a supporter of an, you know, rental equipment background or a person from a Cummins background, I see that, you know, uh, those were the days like when we started getting hitting by the COVID. People are asking for the generator, you know, people are asking for the system, you know, to deploy, to install. We don't have the manpower, we don't have the right equipment and then, you know, the Cummins, everything, you know, back in UK and US, the factories are shut down. People are saying instead of, you know, 12 weeks, it will take 26 weeks. So what, uh, to cut short, I mean, definitely we all become very smart and become smarter. So we all are sitting here because we overcome that. So that's what my takeaway. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Post-COVID and after that, the scenario was very different. It was the same case with every person, every industry, every segment of the in uh, and every department. In our chemicals, we can say that after COVID, uh, there is a great change in the prices, great change in the duties, great changes in the supply chain. Although uh, some countries are being banned, some uh, the import from China is not so easy nowadays and several changes. But these challenges have given us a very good opportunity to go into Make in India concept and do whatever you want to do and make. So we have also stopped some of our imports and we are uh, now manufacturing some of our raw material ourselves only. This was just due to COVID, we can say. Now we can say that it is very good, but earlier it was a very big challenge to uh, match the market requirement and things like that. So every person has its own COVID story, but uh, it, finally it had to be a, on a positive side. Thank you. So for me, I have an interesting uh, take on it. Basically, uh, you know, back in 2019 was when uh, uh, I started getting involved in floating solar projects. And uh, at that time, like I was telling you, the EPCI contractor themselves who have got the job, they have no idea about how they will do the engineering and installation. 
So late in 2019, they came to me and they said that, you know, uh, uh, the installation is planned in, uh, I think it was May 2020, something like that, right? And uh, you have to do the entire engineering, you know, you design the system and everything. And I was thinking this is absolutely not possible uh, because, you know, I come from a, a EPCI background in offshore oil and gas and, you know, engineering starts a year at least before, uh, you know, the actual installation. Year, in some cases, uh, two years before, depending on the complexity of a project. So, uh, and then, like, the national targets are like that, you know, that you have to have this capacity by this year, right? So there was a pressure from the client side and then they were putting that pressure on us. And I was like, it is not possible, you know, we are talking about 100 megawatt uh, plants and, you know, uh, it's very difficult, you have to do the entire engineering. So basically COVID gave me that time, you know, they could, uh, they had an excuse that, you know, they cannot uh, install it during COVID obviously because of lockdowns. The project got delayed by one year, but we developed a lot of uh, technology. Unfortunate uh, it is that uh, COVID happened. There is no doubt about it, but that's, that's the take. I mean, like how it benefited us in terms of developing some technology and also uh, in the end having a safe installation, you know, a better engineered installation. Thank you, Raul. Hamza, your views? Well, I'll go a little bit uh, pre-COVID time and the golden time of solar, at least in the Middle East and UAE, between 2016 and 2019, where we saw the biggest expansion, the win-win situation between supplier, EPC and developers, and more clients interested in solar. I think what COVID gave us was a, a shock and a break to realize that how uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable can we be in any industry, and solar was one of them, how uh, price sensitive, how, uh, how many risk factors, we were not considering them and we were taking them and granted, and now we see them, whether it's the exchange rate or the price fluctuation or the shipment, the locket, all these things made us think about localization, made us think about stock, made us think about uh, pricing and contractual uh, obligation. So. At one point, as you mentioned at the beginning, risk was taken, I mean, maybe until today, risk was taken purely by the EPC. Today, every EPC knows that there will always be chance that something else will come, not only COVID, uh, God forbid, but maybe other things. So they need to reconsider what uh, they want to put. Another thing that helped me going into the academy in this period is really to get out of the fast pace of the EPC and the supplier part and look from outside on the industry. So I could see where are the gaps, where are the things that can be improved, what are the miscommunication, the pricing uh, error and so on. So I think this other thing that also personally uh, was ben uh, I had benefited uh, during the COVID uh, time. Thank you. Thank you, Amze. I'm sure, you know, with uh, the kind of experiences and rich background we all come from, each one of us can speak for one more hour, but unfortunately we have come to the end of the given time slot. So uh, I would like to end this session with one uh, last question to each of the panel members. Uh, you know, UAE has got a very inclusive, uh, you know, uh, business environment. You know, it, it attracts uh, all kinds of businesses and, you know, uh, the way things are going, uh, it looks really great. So how do you see uh, your respective domains in the next 10 years in this part of the world? If we can start with Abhilash. Yeah, uh, very, very easy question, answer for me, you know. So e-mobility e and, uh, you know, smart buildings are definitely the way forward. So I see them growing very fast. You know, the only short term, uh, I would say, the stop gap is the talent. So if you have enough, the right talent with the right basics, you know, obviously new projects with new goals can be made possible. And, you know, that's the only stoppage. But in the next, might be 10 years time, you, know, you will see e-mobility becoming the next solar, you know, and then possibly the smart buildings in the next five years. So that's typically what I'm uh, looking forward to. And I think I'm in the right position to say that, okay, thank you for, uh, you know, letting me lead at some point or the other. Thank you, Abhilash. Abhina? Uh, certainly it is very promising. Uh, as Abhilash says, we, can, we see the short-term uh, kind of, uh, you know, debtor 
kind of a showstopper. But yet to see, you know, uh, solar as a BAU, business as usual. Unlike, you know, we see the uh, people hype getting into hybrid or gas power solution. So we yet to see the people, uh, you know, the, uh, up to that MME or SME level, you know. So, but certainly, yes, uh, solar is the future. Lot of support from the global. We all talk oneness. Uh, either it's United Nations or you talk any continental. So solar is the future, in short. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinav. Asi. Uh, if I see 10 years down the line, the industry going, is going to be expand like anything. Solar is the future. And in chemicals also, we are working on different, different projects. At presently, we are working with a beta testing of some products. After applying that, there should not be any dust deposition or things like that, which is our field. So, uh, as and we are uh, trying to capturing more than 10 to 15 countries. At present, we are also working with 10 countries. So, in this manner, we are going to expand and we see a very good future with the solar. So, the thing about UAE is when it enters a certain scene, it has to be best in the world. There's no doubt about it, right? So, what I see is uh, 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 in the offshore, I'm talking about offshore, uh, UAE does not have a lot of wind uh, as such, you know, uh, but there is a lot of sun, obviously. So, I see in the next 10 years near the palms, we will have floating solar plants and the palms will be getting uh, its energy needs from there. So, that's what is my uh, view of the next 10 years and it's going to be the best in the world. Thank you. Well, when it comes to education, I think education is uh, something that uh, will always be developed and uh, will always be there. So I think uh, the main role in UAE and what we see is also to be part in uh, the energy education or vacation training because with the fast moving uh, base, with the new technologies and with international companies and international audience, I think we will have more and more challenge to develop a unique program that meeting the expectation of the uh, companies and the industry. And I think this can only be realized in such a uh, globalized uh, environment as we have here in Dubai or UAE. Thank you, Hamze. Thank you, all the panelists. I think uh, it's time to conclude our discussion. Uh, on behalf of all the panelists, uh, I thank all the uh, you know, uh, participants and attendees for your patient full hearing. And also thank you, EQ, for this wonderful session. Uh, can we have a group photograph of the all panel members?